Find out what Mormon pioneer John Pierce Holly said to his congregation that shocked them. Hello, I'm Troy Abels from Hanford, California, and you are listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. John Pierce Holly was serving in the bishopric of his southern Utah congregation when he got up and made a surprising announcement. He was leaving the LDS Church for the RLDS Church. Historian Mel Johnson will talk a lot more about it and find out that that wasn't even the last time he got baptized. Check out our conversation. In early 1870, John has come to the conclusion that he wants to join with the RLDS Church. John Larson, a RLDS missionary over near Mountain Meadows, uh, Hamlin area, uh, reads in the Herald, the RLDS newspaper out of Illinois, that one John Pierce Holly has written a letter to Joseph Smith III saying that I rejoice in the doctrines of Joseph Smith Jr. as did my father and I wish to join with the RLDS Church. Larson reads that and he's a former LDS elder out of New Harmony on the other side of the mountain, uh, Pine Valley Mountain out near uh, Fort Hamilton on the road to Cedar City. He reads this and he comes galloping over to Pine Valley and Grass Valley. And John writes, I was convinced that he was as crazy as people thought he was. But I became convinced also that he had the authority to baptize. So he baptized John and his family, George and his family. And then John, as first counselor. Is this his fourth baptism now? There will be a total of seven. <laughs> seven, oh my gosh. Uh, stands up in Pine Valley Ward as the first counselor and preaches his farewell sermon to a very startled audience. And only one historian of Pine Valley will write about John. One of William Snow's granddaughters, I believe, says, and John Hawley, the first counselor, apostatized. That's the full story. Wow. Yet they were one of the, they were among the first settlers, presiding elder, held the second anointing and the second endowment. Quite a guy. Erastus Snow heard. <laughs> Comes galloping up from St. George. Won't let John talk because he's too vile of an, an apostate. Lectures the two Holly brothers for three hours. Then he asks George if he has anything. George says no. And then Rasta Snow rides away. John and George bundle everything up and they travel up to Salt Lake to catch the train to western Iowa. Along the road they meet Rasta Snow. And Erastus says, I read the letter that you sent me after we talked last. Well, they didn't talk last. Snow lectured. And he says, I don't feel about you as I did then. He says, when you're willing to stop stepping out of the way, you are welcome to join us again. Holly told him, I don't believe I believe anything wrong, but thank you. And as far as I can tell, these two friends never communicated or saw each other again. As far as I know, uh, John and George and their families never came back to Utah in their lifetime. When he climbed onto the train with his family and looked around, 37 years of LDS history in his life had gone by from when he was a youngster and baptized. And he gets to Western Iowa, joins his family, is rebaptized, will become an elder, a high priest, 
an important RLDS priesthood holder, missionary, and all of that will happen in the next 39 years of his life. He's only lived half of his adult life by the time he leaves Utah. But he's been in Illinois, Missouri, Iowa, Wisconsin, Texas, the Indian Territories, Utah, helped build the first temple west of the Mississippi, involved somehow in mountain meadows, and he writes about it, and he writes well, and that's what makes it so interesting. One final quick story, less than two minutes. A young girl by the name of Sarah Ann Hadfield is born in Manchester, England. She is christened in the Manchester Cathedral. They are converted to the Mormon Church in 1840. They come over in 1841 and they go to the pineries in Wisconsin. This young teen girl becomes the third wife at 15 to the son of Lyman White. George Hawley steals her away down in Burnett County, Texas, and she becomes his second wife. George treats her and the third wife abominably in Pine Valley she moves into one of the Earl's uh, polygamous homes and becomes the third wife of one of the Earl brothers. She has a baby that's named after her who dies and is buried in the old Pine Valley Cemetery. And then this woman at the age of 33, a plural wife for 22 years to three different men dies and is buried next to her daughter. If you want a condemnation of Utah polygamy, Sarah Ann Hadfield White Holly Earl is the story to tell. John Halley is perhaps one of the three best uh, stories we have that illustrates pan-Mormon history. He knew everybody. It seems that he was everywhere. Talked to Brigham Young numerous times. Had the inside story from Brigham on the coming excommunication of Orson Pratt Jr. Uh, bosom chum of Erastus Snow grew to manhood under Lyman White, ordained a priest by Father John Smith. He was a Mormon of Mormons. Interesting. Well, I know we'll wrap this up. You Just really quickly, you said, so he started with Joseph Smith, Lyman White, uh, Brigham Young, then he went to the uh, RLDS church. Um, I think he joined with the Strangites too for a no, time. He no, he did not. Oh, he did not. Okay. I do not know who is putting that out there, but Holly, as a missionary, <clears throat> saw Strangites on the Mormon in the Mississippi. Whiteites were having missions up the Mississippi and the Missouri trying to get Mormons <clears throat> to come down to Texas. He saw Strangites in the Indian nations who were trying to get people to go up to Wisconsin and Michigan. He knew Strangites all of his adult life, and certainly after the death of James J. Strang, uh, most of them, 80 percent or more, joined the RLDS church, and John would have been part of that, harvesting that group into the RLDS. Okay. So the four baptisms, and you said there were a total of seven? What yeah. were the others? Uh, the final, I can't go through them all. Oh. I'd have to list <laughs> each one and think about it. But the last one was in Iowa, okay. rebaptized into the RLDS church, 
which his community of Christ now does not require it. Uh, his whole family was, and he writes, at that point I thought I had enough of being baptized. <laughs> so he was baptized twice in the RLDS church? Baptized in Pine Valley and then baptized in Western Iowa. Remember, John Larson was considered crazy by almost everybody he knew. <laughs> he knew. Interesting. Yeah. All right, well, I'll let you go. Uh, what, what projects are you working on? Uh, what, what's your next book? Well, I'm very interested in the Indian missions in eastern Oklahoma. Uh, Aaron LeBaron wrote a, an interesting article for the Chronicles of Oklahoma that I personally don't think is complete or an accurate in a couple areas, but still tells a marvelous story of Mormon sanctuary in Indian territory. You had Mormons coming from Texas, down from Kansas, over from Missouri, that part of this diaspora after the death of Joseph Smith, that were part of the manifest destiny of Western America. And the Indian territories, I don't know if you've ever been there, but Eastern Oklahoma, particularly Southeastern Oklahoma, is rich and wonderful forests, farmlands, prairies, deep soil, a little bit like uh, the rolling hills in southern Minnesota, uh, beautiful land. And there were probably a good couple, two, three hundred, four hundred Mormons living in the territories uh, from about 1849 to past 1857. Uh, it was a field to be harvested of what I call free-range Mormons. Preston Thomas had led a colony of Mormons converts up out of Texas and had to stop in the Cherokee Nation because the women in the column uh, finally learned for the first time about polygamy in Utah. And they sat down and said, we're not going any further. Interestingly enough, three years later, several of them were in the wagon train that went to Utah under Jacob Croft with John Hawley as Sergeant of the Guard. I'm very interested in those stories and I want to find the Native American records if they exist at all. Uh, another area that I'm interested in is the Elk Mountain Mission down in Moab. There's 1855, lasted three months and then ended in a flurry of gunfire that killed three American Indians and three Mormon missionaries. The Mormons were allowed to negotiate a retreat out of the area and back to Manti. And white men did not settle permanently in the Moab area for another 22 years, 1877. That's a great story. And then another story that I'm very interested in is John Burton, a slave of Parowan, Utah. I first came across him when I was transcribing the 2,000 pages of James G. Blake's Annals of the Southern Utah Mission. And in that column of Parowan colonists, they're listed by name and by sex and their priesthood and whether they were a member and John, who I know now was a member, had patriarchal blessings, one from Father John Smith, uh, is listed in the column as colored. And I have found a lot of documentation about him. He will die in 1865 in Parowan, one of their first pioneers. It's an amazing story. Patriarchal blessings telling interpreting tongues and fast and testimony meetings of white members. He gives us a what Paul Reeve says is a no, new window to look at color in Utah Territory and Pioneer Days. Great. 
Thank well, you. Thank you. I was going to say, Mel Johnson, thank you so much for spending so much time here on Gospel Tangents. And I hope people will take a look at the life and times of John Pierce Holly and Polygamy on the Pedernalis if you're interested in following these narratives more. All right. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with historian Mel Johnson. I'd like to thank Mel for spending so much time talking to us, and it was really interesting to learn about some of these uh, stories that I certainly didn't know about in early Pioneer Utah. Thanks, Mel. I really appreciate it a lot. In our next conversation, I'm excited to bring back historian Greg Prince. We're going to talk about his new book. Initially, I thought I would write a book about Prop 8 and the Mormon Church's role in it. Because even though people knew that there had been a role, there had not been anything published that tried to take a comprehensive look at that. When I started with Prop 8, I quickly began to realize that Prop 8 wasn't the whole story. We'll have a transcript out shortly to our subscribers. If you'd like to subscribe and get a transcript, go to gospeltangents.com and click the yellow subscribe button. For $10, I'll give you a PDF. For $15, I'll give you a printed copy. You can also do that on patreon.com slash gospeltangents. So just go there as well. You can also get past interviews on our Amazon page. Go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you should be able to see those as well. Please like our page at facebook.com slash gospeltangents and you can get the latest updates there. Also, check our Twitter updates at gospeltangents.com. Be sure to subscribe on our Apple Podcasts page. Go to tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents, and you can subscribe on your iPhone or any Android device. So check that out. Now, for more great videos, click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some more of our great videos.